So, hello again, everyone. Welcome back. Sorry for not jumping on camera like I did last time, but, um, just still ironing out all the formatting and syncing issues, and it, it seemed like more of a headache than I really felt like dealing with tonight. This is honestly about the third go-round I've had on this video, and I just want to get it over with. So, in the meantime, I hope you appreciate the once again updated avatar, courtesy of Robin Gething. He's been bored and busy, as you can see. But he does good work. Um, it's a bit busy, but I like it. We'll see where it goes. So, welcome to Hillary Clinton versus the world. Now, this is going to be sort of a follow-up on my last video. Um, the digging I've been doing into the WikiLeaks email dumps regarding Clinton, especially as the election continues grinding towards the convention and eventual general. It seemed like a very pressing topic, one which I've put actually other videos and essays and articles on hold for, because I wanted to get as much as I could. Now, as, as always, within the um, article that this is based on, as well as um, in the low bar of the video, I'll be providing links to these email dumps, as well as the emails I cite here. I encourage you to go do your own research. Go take a look. Do your own digging. See what you can find. So that being said, the subtitle to this piece is A Hawk in Charge of a Chicken Coop. And I think this is a rather effective way of describing what a Clinton foreign policy really looks like. So to start off with, if, if we consider Hillary Clinton's rhetoric, how she speaks of her experience in international relations and diplomacy, especially when she's in her you know, resume is the best method of campaigning mode. Now, it could be really easy to fall into the mistaken presumption that we're talking about a, a seasoned, sort of no-nonsense, straight shooter on the world stage who's going to you know, be tough but fair, advocate for our interests, but you know, save the world at the same time. All the good shit, because we all know Clinton's never going to admit to doing anything wrong. Now, even in respect to the backpedaling she's done regarding her vote to authorize war in Iraq, which she seems to sort of go back and forth on. Oh, it was a good idea at the time. Oh, I wouldn't do it again. No, whatever. Well, this aside, you know, these emails that have come out are painting very interesting, yet also exceptionally disturbing picture about what a potential Clinton foreign policy might look like. Now, to examine what that might look like, the easiest way to do so is to go to two really relevant and recent examples, and those are the countries of Libya and Syria. Now, these two nations, which have both been racked by bloody civil wars, both are playing host to violent Islamic extremists, ISIS is there beheading all kinds of awful shit. The both of these nations in many ways are victims of Clinton foreign policy. I'm going to explore that now. So the best place to start, I think, would probably be by skipping back to 1969. Now in 69, a young rebel commander named Muammar Gaddafi brought down Libya's sitting king, Idris, in what's often generally described as a bloodless coup. Now, alongside him, during that fight it was a young army officer named Khalifa Haftar. And once Gaddafi became the new ruler, the new president um, within Libya, Haftar found himself promoted rather quickly to the role of chief of staff of the armed forces. Not a bad promotion. Now, Haftar remained a devout loyalist to the new regime, and in 1986, when Gaddafi decided to try and invade the neighboring nation of Chad, he put Haftar in command of the invasion. Now, the Chadian connection to this story, while somewhat sort of light in respect to its own central thesis, is nevertheless really interesting. In 1981, a full 12 years after Gaddafi took power, a Chadian rebel force led by a man named Hissine Habre seized power from then sitting president Gokuni Owedi, Owedi, sorry. Um, but did so with the help, reportedly, of some roughly $10 million in CIA aid and weapons. Now, in this failed 86 uh, invasion of Chad by Libya, then General Haftar was actually taken prisoner and was really held there 
from 86 until 87, until suddenly he threw off his decades of loyalty. Now granted, Gaddafi kind of sold him up the river, saying he had no idea about what was going on, he had nothing to do with it, blah blah blah. But nevertheless, um, in 87, Haftar throws off his loyalty and switches sides. He flips the script and he founds the Libyan National Army, also known as the LNA, which is effectively the military front of the Libyan National Salvation Front. Kind of curious, don't you think? The senior general goes in to invade a country that semi-recently underwent regime change with the help of the CIA, and then suddenly, while he's in prison, he gets flipped himself. Curious, but we'll get back to that. So, now set to topple Gaddafi, Haftar leads the LNA until some point in the early 90s, when following an, a Libyan-backed militia takeover of Chad, this time led by a one-time Habre military advisor named Idris Derby, um, Haftar relocates to, of all places, suburban Maryland, here in the United States, reportedly within roughly a stone's throw from CIA headquarters at Langley. Man, curious connections, they keep popping up. So there he lived in comfort while maintaining, reportedly at least, maintaining ties to Libyan rebels. And he lived here for over 20 years until developments in Libya facilitated his return. And so now we get back to our modern time. So let's step back in time just a little bit more, though. We're going to go back to the August of 2009. Now, in August 2009, in the Libyan city of Zawaya, protests sort of sparked up, protests and demonstrations. Um, against the Gaddafi regime began, and those began spreading across the country. Skip forward a little further to December of 2010, and we have the Arab Spring beginning, with the toppling of the government in Tunisia, um, followed shortly there by many other Arab nations. Now, by February of 2011, the protests in Libya, specifically in Benghazi, had escalated into full-blown rebellion when these protesters and demonstrators um, got involved in really rather nasty, violent clashes with security forces. This basically set fire to the whole country, and soon a full-on rebellion and civil war raged within Libya. And as the U.S. watched and the American State Department watched, then under the directorship of Hillary Clinton, Libya fell into the grips of full-on war between loosely allied forces made up of tribal militias, anti-Gaddafi forces, and even some Islamist forces. In the emails recently released by WikiLeaks, from which this information largely stems, um, in correspondence between Clinton and her senior staff, we've come to learn that Gaddafi's own son, Saif al-Islam, had since 2004 been calling for political reforms in Libya to create a constitutional democracy. Now, despite this, the Clinton State Department's position, as we see in these emails, outright shows us that she was not interested in working with Saif al-Islam or on the ground reformers, but rather that it was her position that continued airstrikes and military support and intervention was instead preferred. Now, keep that in mind as we go forward. Because this was going on at the same time while similar emails from this same dump around the same time show that Clinton, prior to the events that are going on now in Syria, thought that a sectarian civil war within Syria for the purposes of regional destabilization would be good both to bolster Israel's own security while to give the West leverage in the nuclear negotiations with Iran. Effectively, destabilize the region so we can get what we want. Interesting. But this keeps unfolding. Now, as this revolutionary war continued in Libya, their ground commander named Abdel Hakim Belhaj, who is widely regarded and known now as a CIA-backed Al-Qaeda operative with a history of Islamist militancy dating back to his time as a Mujahideen fighter against the Soviets in Afghanistan, began rising to prominence within the rebel ranks. Now he's, this is a dedicated Islamist. Now Belhaj was revered within Islamist circles, both for his long-standing status as a veteran of the Afghan Jihad, as well as his long-standing hatred of Gaddafi, which had resulted in a guerrilla uprising in 1990. 
Now, his presence and ideology both well-known to both intelligence officials as well as the State Department notwithstanding, Belhaj received substantial material support from CIA as the war raged on. Now, in time, Belhaj would continue to wage war within Libya, only later on, as he's currently doing now, he'd be doing so as the ground commander for ISIS in Libya. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're still in the civil war now. Now, with the war against Gaddafi waging, factions which made up the rebel forces were feared to be in a state of disarray. Various militias of elements that have defected from the national army itself were struggling to sort of coalesce into a single fighting force as fighters chose to divide themselves according to their own tribal or religious or military allegiances. Now, as of April 2011, the Libyan National Council, which served as sort of the political body for the rebellion, sought to establish a single commander for the rebel forces. Initially, they were looking to one General Abdel Fattah Yunus. Now, Yunus was a former Gaddafi minister of the interior. He, they were looking to him to head up this, uh, you know, the, the rebel ground force command, as he was relatively well respected, especially after his defection. But all of a sudden, wouldn't you know it, our friend Khalifa Haftar suddenly arrives back from the U.S., throwing all those plans into disarray. Almost immediately after he landed, Haftar was announced as the military commander of rebel forces, with Yunus not really taking the appointment all that lightly. In August of 2011, Tripoli falls, and the revolution against Gaddafi is pretty much complete. As the National Transitional Council, NTC, Libya's transitional government, they immediately began setting about trying to stabilize the nation, with one of the first major problems they encountered, according to the State Department emails, being increasing numbers of demonstrations and even attacks being carried out by groups of student activists, Islamist factions, some pro-Gaddafi loyalists, and largely disgruntled revolutionary fighters known by Libyans as the Thuar. Now, though the state was well aware of this strife, as well as the multiple attacks by various factions against the Egyptian consulate and even murders of high-profile foreign nationals such as Hugo de Sami, who, side note, de Sami, on a simple Google search, only comes up three times in all of Google. And those are all within these email leaks. Referred to as a good friend by these senior State Department officials, he was known as a successful French businessman who had been doing business with the Gaddafi regime for years and now was looking to do business with the new one. Yet still so little information about him. It's curious. Anyway, that's just a side tangent. Despite all of these attacks, despite the car bombings of Egyptian consulate members, despite the murder of high-profile individuals within Libya, as well as the strife between factions themselves, the state seemingly had little interest in really helping the Libyans in their reconstruction. Now we can, again, to sort of pause and consider this, that refusal to work with on-the-ground reformers, followed by suggestions that additional civil war within the region would be good, and destabilization would be good, and then when their revolution is over, even though they've been watching it so closely, the State Department, for all its interventionist interest, didn't really seem to want to lift too many fingers to help. So, what else is going on on the ground in Libya, then? Well, our good friend Khalifa Haftar, assumes a role as a senior military cabinet member and almost immediately begins making a name for himself as an adversary of mainly the Libyan Islamists. Throughout his tenure, Haftar was routinely cast aspersions on Qatar and Saudi Arabia as well as Egypt following their 2012 election of the Muslim Brotherhood, claiming that each was feeding the conflict within Libya. In 2014, then, ooh, Haftar announced that he sought a coup against the Libyan parliament itself which, though resulting in some bloodletting, was altogether unsuccessful. Now, depending upon the sources you look to, some will say Haftar led a bloody rebellion that failed, others will say that it was a, a laughing stock, bloodless attempt at a coup that went nowhere. Either which way, though, this curious player in this tragic comedy tried to lead a coup against the transitional or sitting Libyan parliament. 
Now, it could be fair to ask, what does all of this or any of this have to do with Clinton or the State Department as a majority of the timeline in history have more to do with Libyan affairs domestically than U.S. foreign policy? Well, again, let's consider the attitudes expressed by the Clinton State Department during the Libyan War, as well as the correspondence of events within Libya and after. These do all lead to a curious set of questions and potential hypotheses. To begin with, we have what in the cases of both Syria and Libya are policies which seek to openly or covertly sustain instability for the purposes of strategic, political, geopolitical gain. In the case of Syria, we have effectively an open desire for civil war, which as we know now happened with calamitous net effects. While in Libya, we have a refusal to work with political reformers, desires to continue airstrikes, as well as the funding of Islamic jihadists fighting on the behalf of the rebellion. Now, a curious thing, though, we have still continued airstrikes whenever we more or less wanted to. I find it an interesting thing to wonder how it is that the State Department and naturally the CIA can be well aware of this Al-Qaeda-turned-ISIS leader, yet he's still alive. Regardless, though, we also then have a military commander. Now, this guy, Haftar, I find him just endlessly fascinating. Let's consider his timeline. He rises to prominence within the revolution alongside Gaddafi in the 60s. Um, ends up being taken prisoner of war in Chad, a regime known to have the support of CIA, when sent to invade it. Defects while in custody becomes a rebel leader, seemingly overnight, against his one-time uh, leader. Then flees to the U.S. when said CIA-backed Chadian regime falls to what is pretty widely known to be a Libyan-backed regime, only to wind up living within shouting distance of CIA headquarters. Then this commander, after nearly 20 years of comfortable life in the States, returns to Libya in the 11th hour to become not only the commander of the rebel forces on the ground against Gaddafi, but also then goes on to attempt a coup against the transitional parliamentary government as a senior cabinet member of said government before going into retirement. On top of these, again, we have this CIA-backed militia commander. All of this... Throughout all of this, a consistent theme seems to emerge within respect to Hillary Clinton and the State Department's attitude towards affairs, and that is one of a concept of recognizing, exacerbating, and exploiting the strategic benefits, short-term strategic benefits, of regional instability. Now, whether we're going to go back to the days of the sort of crypto-fascist change efforts of Operation Ajax, where... American and British intelligence forces overthrew the Iranian leader Mohammad Mossadegh, installing the brutal Shah Reza Pahlavi, who in turn inspired the Islamic Revolution leading to Iran today, up through more modern examples, such as the American war in Iraq, the foreign policy efforts at effectively gaming the international community and select regions for strategic, political, or resource gains, seems to be an almost constant central portion of the policy proposals put out within these circles of political elites. You really don't get much more elite than Hillary Clinton, to be honest with you. Now, looking upon what is revealed information regarding the developments and situation within Libya, as well as the secretaries, and the former now Secretary Clinton's own attitudes towards the conflict and how America ought best to factor its resource and attention towards it, this altogether destructive and short-sighted pattern seems to emerge once again. Was the goal of the State Department's refusal to work with in-country reformers and CIA's expressed interest in arming what they knew well ahead of time to be an Islamist, Al-Qaeda-associated radical group within Libya, part of an effort to destabilize the country? in pursuit of an advantage over maybe Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood and other, other rival powers in the region? Was, slash is, Khalifa Haftar, CIA asset, dispatched in the hopes of maybe installing a, pop, a puppet government of some kind within Libya, and later maybe even within the military, 
just so as to have within him a potential leader of a coup for a new puppet government altogether. Were the attacks on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi something that the State Department should have foreseen, given all of the evidence that they were aware of such violence and attacks already? And if so, was their inaction part of a larger effort to sow disruption and chaos into an already chaotic scene so as to shore up additional support for their ally, Haftar? Well, I am no fan of conspiracy theories. In the case of this Clinton legacy in Libya, such is really hard to ignore. What is known for certain is that conditions within Libya in respect to the growing Islamist movement, culminating in the establishment of ISIS in Libya, was known to Clinton and the State Department well before the revolution had even been completed. What else is known is that by manner of miraculous timing, a suspected CIA asset was placed within the revolution and later the government at the 11th hour, setting the stage for what was an almost outright coup against the Libyan government. Finally, we know from her own comments on Syria that Clinton is one who, blew, who views bloody civil wars and sectarian violence as potential boons to strategic international affairs and goals. This all being said, you are invited to dig deeper on your own. I'll provide links in the low bar as well as throughout the article if you're finding this on the rationalists.org. Anywhere you see this video, I will hope you will find links. And if not, follow the video and you'll find links at its source. And dig into this email archive provided by WikiLeaks. Just, just dig into it. Search key terms. Take key terms from this. Take key terms from other things. Do your own digging and draw your own conclusions. As it stands right now to me, the pictures painted thus far by these Clinton emails paint a picture of an almost sociopathic chicken hawk who followed their vote for military authorization in Iraq only to take on a role at state with an equally if not more so sort of Machiavellian imperial view of power and conflict. This should, as I hope, factor into some decision-making of voters in the U.S. in the following months, as it needs to be made absolutely clear that in respect to foreign policy, at least one candidate we have has a vested and demonstrable track record that can and should be seen as a blueprint for what they might do as president. And I quite honestly, for one, I think we've had enough of this bloody game of risk that these wealthy elites like to play. So, I guess that's all for now. I may, well, I will continue doing digging into this. I don't know how much more I'll produce naturally if I stumble across something that just begs an article and a video. You can be sure that I'll do it. Um, short of that, though, as I said, please go do your own digging. Find what you can, because this is important pressing information and there's a whole lot of it to go through use the links that i provided use whatever links you can follow wikileaks they're constantly coming through and giving all kinds of gems through twitter and social media even though certain social media outlets are starting to tamp down on it so that all being said thank you for listening if you would like the video share it around subscribe if you haven't already and if you want to see more work like this or more of anything else I've got in this catalog of videos that I'm building. Um, if you'd like to support that, feel free to jump over to my Patreon and throw me a few shekels. Otherwise, thank you for your time, and I'll see you next time.